Welcome to Plotcast episode 99. You know, if you know what this means, it means that we're just one episode shy of Plotcast episode 100. That's a real milestone. But I will be chortling about that in the next one, not in this one. This is Plotcast episode 99. Thanks for joining us. Good to have you here. So I want to talk about um, culture and the fact that faith is upstream from uh, culture and that culture is upstream from politics. There are many, uh, there are many political blessings that we currently enjoy that we uh, are recipients of in Western culture, and particularly here in the United States. And these blessings came from somewhere. Um, it's very easy, you know, if you're, if, if you're the millionaire's kid and you're growing up uh, in an affluent household and there's just always food in the fridge, um, you, if you're hungry, you go to the fridge. You just say, that's where food comes from. That's where, uh, that's where I go get the ice water. That's where I go, uh, you know. So if you grow up around wealth, you uh, you take it for granted. We have grown up around an enormous amount of moral capital. Um, there are things that we take for granted. We think that, well, this is just the way human societies should be, or they either are most of the time and should be all of the time. And uh, we just assume that it's our birthright, and we assume that it's just kind of there, uh, not recognizing, not realizing that um, there are all sorts of things that we take for granted that are not commonplace in other societies at all. Now, not only we, when it comes to this moral capital, uh, and I'm talking about everything from the fact that uh, people know how to line up at the post office or at the bank, they, they take their, wait their turn. Um, People uh, as, assume that you should be different, you know, whether it's holding, uh, holding the door for someone else to go through, go into the building first, or, you know, all kinds of those sorts of things are part of our culture because they've been instilled in our, in our culture over the course of centuries. Now, um, in The Abolition of Man, C.S. Lewis says, uh, with a sort of, he talks about people who have not thought the issue through, and they, he says, uh, in a sort of ghastly simplicity, they remove the organ and demand the function. They castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. They, they want to cut down the apple tree and still have apples. So, why, why is this important? Well, let me, there, this is important on any number of things, from treatment of women to respect for life to uh, what I want to talk about, which is religious liberty. Religious liberty is not a secular value. Religious liberty is a religious value. Uh, the prodigal son, uh, when he first left home, had the illusion of bottomless wealth. He, he could buy drinks on, for the house. He could throw a party, and he had the money to do it because he had asked for his father's money. He had this um, inherited capital that he was in the process of squandering, and because he was squandering it, it was at some point going to run out. But while he was running out, he didn't have, this, he didn't have the sens sensation of running out, just as uh, someone who jumps off a cliff in the grip of a delusion can honestly feel like he's flying. Um, like a parachutist, a skydiver feels like he's flying, and, and after a fashion, he is, because he's got, uh, he's got a backup plan. But someone without a parachute can feel like he's flying, but he's not flying. He's going to have a rude awakening. Shifting the metaphor, just like the prodigal son had a rude awakening when he ran out of money. All right, so... Um, Respecting the religious opinions of those that differ with you is a fruit. It is uh, that respect deferring to someone else who differs with you on important issues 
that respect is something that was grown over the course of centuries in the West. Our culture produced it. It's a um, religious liberty, I'll, I'll put it this way, religious liberty is a Christian value. Religious liberty is a Christian value. It's not a secular value. But what, it hap what has happened is the secularists have, in parasitic fashion, taken over a Christian culture and have been um, emptying, out, uh, emptying, emptying it out, spending the capital, spending the inheritance while pretending that the remaining money is money that they themselves earned. And we are now starting to see the totalitarian heart of secularism, because we, when, when Christians say, so, so uh, all we would like is a place at the table, all we would like is to have our, our beliefs respected also, the answer comes back, well, you can't have your beliefs respected also, because, you're, because your beliefs are hateful. Your, your beliefs are intolerant. Your beliefs are outside the pale. Um, and this is because the overarching system, which used to be Christian, is now secular. And we're now seeing that mankind is a uh, logically consistent being over time, corporately. Uh, you could have a next-door neighbor. Your, ne your next-door neighbor could be an atheist and still be a nice guy and still be someone that you'd be willing to ask to watch your house when you're on vacation. His atheism does not possess him to run over and burn your house down as soon as your car's around the, uh, you know, around the corner. Um, so an individual atheist can be inconsistent with his premises, but atheistic societies are never inconsistent with their premises. If a, if a society is godless, what you're talking about is Mao's China. You're talking about uh, uh, North Korean totalitarianism. So what we're what we're after here is what we have to understand is that Christian civilization can survive in cut flower fashion in a vase for a time. But as with all forms of cut flowers, they're going to die. You cut them from the root, you, you've removed them from the soil, they're in a vase, you can put them in water and keep it going for a little bit of time. You can you can have certain values that come from that accrue from Christian civilization for a time, just like you can have brightly colored flowers in a in a vase for a time. But that's all you're going to have. The flowers are the flowers are in the process of dying. So um, we need to ask: What sorts of values do we have? Political, civic, public square values. What sorts of values do we have? that are actually values that are derived from a Christian worldview? Does the First Amendment arise from a secular worldview? Does the Tenth Amendment arise from a secular worldview? Does the Second Amendment arise from a secular worldview? And the answer is no, no, and no. Always we will be God. So we're continuing in... Uh, uh, episode 99 of our podcast, and this is the Martiology section, and we're going to talk about the word uh, apatao, apatao, A-P-A-T-A-O, and it means to deceive, and it's used four times in the New Testament. The first time is in Ephesians, let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. That's Ephesians 5, 6, let no man deceive you. The kind of vanity in view here is the vanity that flatters our lusts, that makes us think that it's possible for someone to live in sin and yet be in Christ. A similar deception ensnared Eve, our first mother. She was told that it was possible to disobey God and yet not die. That's what she was told. You will, you will not die. Just go ahead. Uh, 1 Timothy 2.14, and Adam was not deceived, apatow, but the woman was being deceived was in the transgression. So Adam was not deceived, meaning that when Adam sinned, he sinned with his eyes open. Um, keep in mind, uh, remember that 
when uh, uh, when God prohibited the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and gave that prohibition to Adam, Eve was not yet created. So Eve got the prohibition of the tree from Adam, not from the Lord directly. The Lord gave Adam the prohibition, and that meant that Adam was not confused at all about what he was doing. It says expressly in 1 Timothy 2.14 uh, 2, that Eve was deceived and Adam was not deceived. And then last, James rebukes the man who wants to appear religious but still keep his heart deceived and his tongue unbridled. Such a man has a vain religion, meaning that it does not, that it does not accomplish what religion is supposed to do, which is save you. If a man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, he deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. So, deception, uh, this is uh, interesting. The deception is a, a very, a, deception is a destructive sin, because once someone has successfully lied, and then that lie is uncovered, uh, the people who have found out that this person is a liar or that, or that he bore false witness, uh, they don't know what to believe anymore. Everything, it throws a cloud over absolutely everything. Uh, so deception is a, is a gnarly sin. Self-deception is even stranger. So uh, it says here, if anyone thinks he's religious and bridles not his tongue, he deceives his own heart. He deceives himself. So self-deception is is quite a striking thing. How is it possible for me to lie to me and to have me buy it? How is it possible possible for me to lie to me and pull the lie off? Well, clearly we are complicated beings. We don't have we don't have a small, tiny brain capable of only holding one thought at a time. And then that would create the contrary. How can I, how can I be self-deceived? No. We have all kinds of ways. Our, our brain has all kinds of things going on in it. And you can, one part of you can lie to another part of you and have that other part of you say, yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. That sounds reasonable. Um. Many years ago, I read about an experiment where uh, some psychologists uh, had a bunch of people, uh, I think they were overweight people, to simply journal for like for two or three weeks. All they had to do was write down what they, had, what they ate. If they had a Snickers bar, they would write down a Snickers bar. If they had an apple at three o'clock, they would write down an apple at three o'clock. And so all these people were just faithfully journaling uh, everything that they ate. And then they, after the time period was up, after two or three weeks was up, they, they gathered all the people up and took them off to a uh, secure location. And for the next two or three weeks, they fed them what they said they'd been eating the first two or three weeks. So uh, if you said on Tuesday afternoon at 3 o'clock you had a Snickers bar, Someone would come in your room and give you a Snickers bar. <laughs> you know, so um, they had everybody eat what they said they'd been eating the previous uh, time period. In the previous time period, no one was losing weight. And the second time period, everybody started to lose weight like crazy, which means that they were deceiving themselves. So how is it possible for one part of you to tell another part of you a lie and have you believe it? Well, James tells us that one of the ways that we can get into that uh, condition is by pretending to be religious and not bridling his tongue. So saying I'm religious, but not controlling your tongue, that's the way into um, self-deception. Well, we're continuing on with episode uh, uh, 99 of our podcast, and the book I want to review this uh, uh, this go round is my daughter's book, uh, Yuhu. So um, now, so some people might think that our family sits around in the living room and and writes books at each other, uh, which is not quite accurate. But there, you know, there's a lot of book writing. There are a lot of um, a lot of people in our family that, that love to write, and so consequently, it's hard. And and even though we love to, even though we also love to read, it's sometimes hard to keep up. So. 
I read uh, I read at least some of Rachel's uh, book in manuscript as it was uh, coming out, maybe the first part of it, or first chapter or so. Um, but then after the book came out, I, I got a copy and and put it in my queue and just worked through it slowly. And uh, and and what this uh, what this book is about is addressed uh, addressed to women, and it has to do with uh, their identity in Christ. And uh, Rachel was, is keying off the fact that everywhere women go today, whether it's to the grocery store to buy a box of Kleenex, or it's to buy a new set of frames for their glasses, or to um, uh, buy, a mag- buy a women's magazine because they're interested in the, uh, how you, you know, gardening tips or whatever. Um, women are constantly being urged to make idols out of themselves, to to reach, to dig down deep in their own soul, into their own psyche, and to find their identity there. And of course, it doesn't work, and it's endlessly frustrating, and so women are miserable and happy, uh, unhappy as they uh, do this. It doesn't. It just doesn't work. And so they fi- they find themselves on this uh, endless repeating cycle where they try to they need to go on a you know a weekend getaway they need some me time they need to take these oils they need to you know all of these things that will help them find themselves but this is not the task that God sets for us Jesus says that if we uh, if any man wants to come after him, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow the Lord. So the Christian life begins with a self-rejection, self-denial. And the Lord says, if you lose yourself for my sake, you will find yourself. So the first will be last and the last first. So what we're dealing with is we, we live in a time when women are being told ad nauseum over and over and over again that if you want to be first, you've got to be first. Uh, the first will be first. The last will be last. Pedal harder. Strive some more. Do it again. And what Rachel does in this book is she simply and uh, pointedly points women to Christ. That's where your identity is. And if you lose yourself in Christ, you find yourself. If you lose yourself in Christ, you're raised up again. If you lose yourself in Christ, you don't ultimately lose yourself. But if you try to hang on to yourself, if you strive with everything you've got to hang on to your own, uh, to hang on to your own identity, that's the first and central thing that you lose: your own identity. And that's uh, that's where many women are today. They don't know who they are. Shoot, we're, we've gotten to the point where people don't even know what they are. It's it's not a matter of saying, I don't know who I am anymore. Yeah, that's un, the, yeah, we sort of get that. I don't know what I am anymore. Am I a boy? Am I a girl? Am I what? What am I? A mom? Am, you know, um, and we've gotten to the point. I I have to pursue this, but I think um, someone in the, as I'm recording this, uh, uh, the d- first Democratic debate uh, for presidential. Uh, the presidency happened last night, and I think one of the candidates said that that uh, uh, transgender women had the right to an abortion. So, <laughs> well, that's either really, really stupid or really, really woke. Anyway, you have to. Uh, uh, I would I would say that if you are dealing with any woman, if there's any woman in your family, if there's any friend that you have that's struggling with this uh, issue of identity, uh, this book, you who is clearly written, plainly written. It's really bracing, and it's gospel-saturated, and uh, it's an invitation to women to find their way back to Christ. God don't never change. He's God. You've spent a pleasant half hour with podcast proprietor Douglas Wilson. This podcast is produced by Canon Press. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite listening platform. To hear more from Doug, please visit canonpress.com.